Hello, everyone. Welcome to Your Bible Questions Answered. I'm your host, Dr. Douglas Hamp. Looking forward to getting into your questions today. Some great ones uh, out there, so we're going to get into those. Before we do, remember you can donate to this ministry through patreon.com forward slash Doug Hamp. Again, give as little or as much as you want. Big shout out to those who are already doing that. It's a huge help, so thank you so much. Really do appreciate it. Also, we're going to Israel in April of 2024. You can go to thewaycongregation.com to get all the information on that. So please do join us. Uh, we're looking forward to it. So here we go. We've got some uh, some great questions in store. I think we're going to have a lot of fun with these. I'm very much looking forward to them. And uh, we'll get going. So let me get my Bible ready, my software, so that I can share these cool uh, discoveries with you guys. And there we go. Okay. So our first question, let me just pull that up. It seems like my computer did something weird. Okay. Uh, this is from Robert. He says, is there a difference between seraphim and cherubim? Can you go into detail on what both are? Thank you. Yeah, Robert, fantastic question, uh, naturally. So let's take a look here at Isaiah chapter 6, which talks about the seraphim. Now, the word saraf, it just means to burn, all right? So seraphim, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Let's take a look now at Revelation 4, 8. Okay, now keep this in mind, guys, because we're going to see here these four living creatures, each having six wings. Okay, so that sounds like what? Sounds like a seraphim, doesn't it? It really does. But notice that they're full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night saying, saying what? Holy, 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 right? So um, that is what they do. All right. So these creatures, holy, holy, holy. Now, who says holy, holy, holy? Well, the ones in Isaiah 6, 2. But it says that they have eyes around and within. So that is also very significant. If we take a look at Ezekiel, which talks about the cherubim, I would argue that they're the same thing. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes all around. All right, so it sounds like the description is for both of these. What I would suggest is the word seraphim just means fiery ones, and that when we look at the cherubim, guess what? They are indeed fiery. So I think we're talking really about one and the same creature. All right, take a look at, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright and out of the fire went lightning. Well, those sound like fiery ones, right? Again, the word serafim, saraf, it means to burn. So if we're talking about these burning ones and the description of them is burning ones, it sounds to me like they are one and the same thing. And they have eyes all around. So we see that these descriptions are really talking about one and the same thing. Now, the only challenge that we have is that in um, Isaiah chapter 6, the seraphim have six wings, whereas the cherubim appear to have only four wings. So that is a little bit of a stumper, I have to admit. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to resolve that other than perhaps uh, it's a matter of perception. Perhaps Ezekiel just didn't see all of their wings. I mean, that's the only thing that I can think of is that maybe he didn't see those other wings. Maybe they were not important at that moment. Um, so, so that would be the only thing that I can think of. But um, I think that they are really one and the same creature. I think there's uh, really good reasons uh, to think that. All right, let's get to our next question. Thank you, Robert. That was great. Uh, this is from Eclegacy. I am confused on the issue of circumcision. If we are circumcised of the heart, born again nature, do we need to be circumcised of the flesh as well in order to be saved, resurrected with a new body? So this is, of course, a challenging question. There's no question, no doubt about that. Right now, if we look at the Apostle Paul, 
he was constantly being bombarded with questions from uh, the party of the circumcision. That is these Jews who said, look, unless you're circumcised, you don't have any part in it. So he makes a very compelling case, which I agree with in the book of Romans, that Abraham was justified before, before he was circumcised. Okay, we see that in Genesis chapter 15. Abram was declared righteous, right? His faith was accounted to him as righteousness, and that was before he was circumcised. So you don't need to be circumcised in order to have a right relationship with God. That's number one. Number two, in uh, Genesis chapter 17, let's take a look at that. Because in Genesis 17, what we find there is that um, <clears throat> so here he is and this is where of course he gets circumcision all right and i will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly abram, abram fell on his face um you're not going to call it abram but abraham all right and i will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And I will also give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, I'll be your God. As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, right? And of course, it's all about the circumcision. So I think we could argue that based on this, that the circumcision has to do with the land of Canaan. So whether or not, um, you know, a, a, a person needs to be circumcised, I would suggest it. I would recommend it. All right. Just based on what I'm reading, it seems like that's probably a good idea to be circumcised. Now, I know that's uh, there's a real price in that. I, I get that. OK, so. This is why I'm speaking somewhat uh, tentatively. I'm trying to, um, you know, to look at this uh, with as much candor as I can and to not come to uh, any kind of crazy uh, suggestions, all right? But uh, I think that circumcision is something that is highly recommended. I don't think that Paul was against it. I think he was against the idea that you had to be circumcised in order to be saved, right? Uh, but it does not negate the need for circumcision. But if you are not circumcised, would that somehow preclude you from being in the eternal covenant in, in heaven? I don't think so, all right? Uh, and so I'm saying that tentatively because, again, it's a hard question. So thank you for hard questions. I, I'm appreciative. <laughs> All right. I'm going to leave it there for now. Okay. All right. So this is from Bob. He says, Doug, do you think that belief in the atonement as in Jesus paid for my sins on the cross as a substitutionary act could be a salvation issue? I've always believed that salvation was in the person Jesus and work on the cross. Some today believe in Jesus, but his work on the cross was just an example of his love and that the idea of him paying for my sins is an awful doctrine or idea. Some would call it barbarous. I am pretty sure I was saved, even though I may not have fully understood the doctrine, but I never denied it. 1 Corinthians 1.18 would make me think that those who deny this atoning work are not or may not be saved. Any input would be appreciated. All right, let's just go to 1 Corinthians 1.18 just to get a sense of what is going on there. All right, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. Right, okay, so there's, of course, uh, a lot to unpack in this. And if you guys want to check it out on my YouTube channel, uh, I talk about why did Jesus have to die, all right? And I come up with uh, five really powerful things. One is that that God and the creation were basically split apart at the fall of Adam. And of course, God and Adam were split apart at the fall of Adam, right? So you have heaven and earth were, were uh, 
mixed up, right? We're separated. The God and Adam were separated. Then death entered into Adam. And then you have uh, God and Israel. And there was a, a marriage relationship there. And then that broke. So that had to be repaired. And then there's me, okay? And, and the individual. So I would suggest that we have to take into consideration all of those things. And I think by and large, what Christianity, modern Christianity has done is it's only focused on the personal salvation and to the exclusion of the others. And that has probably gotten us in a little bit of trouble because while, yes, my personal salvation is incredibly important, I will absolutely agree with that. The others are also important, right? So what if I'm saved, but then the earth isn't restored? Well, that's not so great. Okay. Um, if I'm saved, but then the death part isn't taken away, well, that's a real problem, right? So we have to take a, a look at all of, all, all of those different things uh, in order to, uh, to, to understand that. So again, without hearing, you know, who is saying that and kind of how they're saying it, I would suggest just based on the things that I've heard, that there could be some teachers who are saying, look, it shouldn't only be about your personal salvation, right? What Jesus did on the cross is more than that. Uh, and that's at least how I teach it. You know, how these others teach it, of course, up to them. So, but that that's how I take a look at that. So um, I, I absolutely think the, the cross was absolutely necessary, not only for my salvation, but for the entire world. I dig a, into this a lot in Corrupting the Image Volume 2, if you guys want to check that out. Uh, I think this has to do with a matter of authority that Satan essentially robbed Adam and Eve of their God-given authority, right, dominion over the planet. And then to get it back, Jesus had to go to the cross to purchase that back. And yeah, I mean, he would have died for me personally, and he did, but he did so much more. And so I think it's the so much more part that is often left out of this conversation that probably leads to uh, some confusion as we kind of get into this this different topic. All right. Uh, thank you, Bob. That's a great question. All right. Diana asks, was Paul a eunuch? Um, I don't think so. Um, not sure why. Not sure why some people would suggest that, but I don't believe that he was a eunuch. Uh, so that's my opinion. Okay. Uh, this is from Diana. If the only place where I can buy lamb near me is a halal Muslim meat market, what should I do? I don't know much about halal ritual slaughtering, but I do know they pray to Allah over the animal. And I know that Allah is not Yehovah. So does that make him an idol? Uh, no question mark. Okay. So yeah, Diana, this is a, this is a challenging one. There's, there's no question about that. This was something that we had to uh, kind of ask ourselves a couple of years ago when we were preparing for Passover. We wanted to have lamb and the best price in town was certainly Costco. Uh, but the Costco meat is, um, well, it's halal. So what we ended up doing in the end was we decided to not go with Costco or halal meat. Because um, while I don't think Allah is anything and it really doesn't bother me, what we felt was there may be people that if they discovered that we bought halal meat, uh, that could make them stumble, right? And this is what I think Paul is really talking about in Romans chapter 14. So let's take a look at that. Romans 14, because I think this is, this is what this is supposed to be used for. Receive the one who is weak in the faith, but not to dis not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but one who uh, is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let, uh, let not him who, who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. All right, so, so that's one. All right, uh, let's take a look also at 1 Corinthians both 8 and uh, 10. All right. So 
Uh, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscious sake. For the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscious sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you. And for conscious sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? All right, so... This is a this is certainly a challenging one that uh, Paul had to deal with as well, right? So, if somebody sets some food before me, just eat it. Okay, that's the big deal, right? Because the earth is the Lord's, right? Everything belongs to the Lord. Now, again, Paul is not saying that if pork is set before you, then just go ahead and eat that. That's what many Christians have concluded based on this, and that is faulty reasoning. That's incorrect theology. But what he is saying, if it's if it's kosher, okay, if this is beef or chicken or lamb, then and if it's set before you, because it's in the meat market that you're allowed to eat from, great, right? But then if he says, oh, this was actually this was actually uh, this food right here that I'm putting before you, this was offered to an idol, well, then you you definitely want to uh, take issue with that because of the person who is sitting before you might say, oh. He's good with eating food that was offered to idols. In fact, he's endorsing those idols. That's where the problem comes in. So here's the thing, Diana, if it's just you going to the meat market, whether it's Costco or some other place, and you know that it's halal, buy it, think nothing of it, right? You're going to eat it with yourself. Great. Okay. But if you were going to somebody's house and they said, oh, this was offered to Allah. Now you're like, well, <laughs> I, I can't do that, right? I, I, you know, I don't want to do that. In fact, probably many times in Paul's day, a lot of the food was offered to idols, right? And but you can go to the meat market and just buy it. It's when somebody specifically says this was offered to idols. Here, you're going to eat it. Then you have a problem, right? So, um, you know, if you buy the halal meat, and then somebody says, well, was this offered to idols? Well, now there's a problem, right? Because now, now there's an issue, okay? So I think it, you know, insofar as it's for your, you, you personally, there's no issue. Uh, when you start feeding a bunch of people, it could become an issue, not because there's anything to it, but because uh, there, there could be a conscious issue, which could really uh, have an effect on people. So, so that's the challenge that we're, we're essentially faced with. All right, uh, let's keep on moving. All right, um, this is from Nick. So I'm new to a lot of this stuff. A friend of mine turned me on to your Corrupting Image books. So my timelines and knowing when everything happened is sketchy. Since God is all-knowing, did God create man knowing Satan would rebel and become Lord of the of this world and God also knowing man would fall as well before creating him create man for the reason to defeat Satan with the plan to send Christ or did Satan only rebel because man was created? Well, Nick, um, when we start getting into, you know, the mind of God and why did he do these things and what did he know? We can assume that God knows everything. He says that he knows the end from the beginning. So there are no surprises in God's economy. He's not shocked. They're like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that happened. I didn't see that one coming. Right. He, he did know what was coming. And yet he allows each one of us to freely choose our own path. So we get to we get to choose that path. And uh, he knew what path, you know, Satan would choose and what path Adam would choose. But God did not make them choose those paths. So God already had in mind the solution for the choices that would be made. That's the beautiful thing about it. Again, God is not surprised by any of these things, right? But it's not to say that he in any way made Satan or man uh, choose what they chose. 
So I would I would suggest though that Satan, based on my book in Corrupting Image Volume Two, that uh, Satan was filled with jealousy when he saw Adam, and when God uh, gave the dominion of the planet to Adam, that really caused a lot of jealousy. And so based on that, Satan then fell. All right. So uh, yeah, I hope that I hope that helps you uh, kind of put some of these things together. Very good. This is from Jamie. Pastor Doug, can you please comment on extra biblical texts and how much a Christian should rely on them? I'm so grateful for writings such as First Enoch and the Septuagint that seem to fill in so much of the historical background of the Bible. But I've heard many Christians say important texts were removed from our current Bible or there are other important writings that were lost or hidden. How should a Christian consider or receive these so as not to be deceived? Should any new information uh, always confirm or elaborate on the truth already found in the Bible? Great question, Jamie. Uh, I use extra biblical texts to help understand how people were thinking about things. So I love the, first, the book of First Enoch because it helps me understand what Jews in the Second Temple period were thinking about various topics. Now, having said that, I also do believe that parts of the book of First Enoch are probably very ancient and authentic. The trouble is I'm not entirely sure which parts it is, you know, those would be. So I use them quite loosely. I use them guardedly. Uh, the idea that books were taken out, I really think is a misnomer. Uh, I, I've heard this many times. Oh, they took all these books out. But understand that the Old Testament canon, the Hebrew Bible canon, was already decided by the time of the first century. Okay, so by the time Yeshua came, there was no question as to which books were considered sacred writ, right? That was already established. And then, uh, of course, with the New Testament, obviously that was took a little different path, but there were books that were in circulation that were considered to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were uh, in circulation, they were used, and they were deemed to be God's word. So the idea that things were taken out, I think is really a misnomer. Now, there were things that were included, such as Maccabees um, and some of the other historical books that, yes, did fill in some of the history and the uh, the early early publishers of uh, of the entire codex of the Bible put those in in the middle so that people could have that historical uh, reference there, but they never considered it to be scripture. Right. So so that's part of the trouble is that, you know, you have to understand that um, things were very difficult to get. Um, you know, you couldn't just go down to your library and get the book of first Maccabees and check it out. Um, you know, you couldn't certainly look online. Right. So you were doing people a service by putting these ancient texts in this book so that they became available. But they were never considered to be holy writ. And that is the difference. And I think that is where some of our zealous brothers and sisters uh, come up with some of these theories that just confuse the whole matter. So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people like to look at the book of Jasher. The book of Jasher, as I know it, is a complete forgery. Uh, and it's very, very late. We're talking 1500s or 1600s AD, right? So it's it's very late. It's not a reliable book. So I, I, I put zero stock in the book of Jasher. But I know a lot of people like it and they're like, oh, but it sounds so much like the Bible. Sure. You know, I remember reading the book of Adam and Eve years ago. I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is really filling out all the details. But then I discovered that it was written around 400 AD. I was like, oh, bummer, because it's kind of a cool story. But I, I have no faith in the book of Adam and Eve because it's just probably complete invention. So you have to you have to take every one of these extra biblical books, the book of Jubilees. Does it have value? Yes. But is it holy writ? Is it absolutely inspired by God and I can stake my life on this? No, I would not do that. So I would be very careful uh, about that. But great question. This is from Robert. Can you explain Isaiah 7, 13 through 16? I understand that it is about Jesus, which is the far fulfillment of the prophecy. But what was the near fulfillment? How was it fulfilled in Ahaz's time? All right, Isaiah 7, 13. 
let me pull that up for you. And uh, I'm sorry about the coloration. For some reason, my camera is looking a little bit funky today. Who knows why? Okay. So Isaiah 7, 13. All right. So let's go back just a little bit. All right. So um, moreover, the Lord said to Ahaz, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But it has said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he, then he said, here now, O house of David. All right, so notice, God is saying, look, ask something for yourself, right? For yourself, uh, from the Lord your God, the height above, earth, or the height, height above, the depth below, whatever. Um, oh, I'm not going to do that. So then it seems that he really says, O house of David. It's not just for Ahaz. Why is he asking this? Because Ahaz is about to set up a... Uh, a confederacy or, uh, you know, a, uh, a covenant with the Assyrians to try to stop these other guys, to, to stop the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria, who were teaming up against him. So he was turning to Syria and God is saying through Isaiah, don't do it. God is going to take care uh, of all you need. Okay. Therefore, the Lord said, Himself, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Right now, I'll notice it's to the house of David. Behold, the virgin or the, the young damsel shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us, right? Curds and honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. All right, the Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and uh, all this other stuff, okay? So let's go now to the next chapter, chapter 8. Moreover, the Lord said to me, take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz, and I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Yeberechia. Uh, then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said, call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz, for before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father, my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. Okay, so all of this, right? So we have, yes, we have a near and a far, right? So you have this immediate situation. You've got your neighbors wanting to destroy you. So then Ahaz thinks, well, I'm going to call over to Assyria and they're going to come help me. And that's eventually what he did. Um, and God says, you know, ask anything. And I'll, I'll show it. I'll do it. And he says, oh, I can't test the Lord. So then God seems to change his focus from the near to, hey, now there's going to be this sign that's going to uh, blow your mind. All right. So and this is talking about Messiah. All right. But then probably when we get to verse 15, this seems to be talking about um, what happened with the priestess. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we see here, it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee, they will come. And the same day, the Lord will shave for the hired razor with those from beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs. And I will also remove the beard. And it shall be in that day that a man will keep a lot of young cow and two sheep. So it shall be from the abundance of the milk they give that he will eat curds from curds and honey. Everyone will eat what is left in the land. All right. So this is not a good thing. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, so he's, so the, the verse 15 is really talking about uh, going back to the near uh, in Ahaz's day. But it's really in verse 14 that we have this uh, prophecy of Jesus, uh, this one named Emmanuel. Okay, so very good. Thank you, Robert. This is from Robert. Rob, a uh, popular YouTube channel states that Christ honored and was committed to the Hebrew laws and thus had to be married. Is this a viable argument? Well, I don't think so. There's no place in scripture that says you must get married. It just doesn't say that. Uh, there was certainly an expectation that you would get married. That was the normal thing to do, but there's no law that says you have to get married. So I just don't know what people were talking about on that one. 
All right. And of course, we're getting close to Christmas. <laughs> what are your thoughts about Christmas? All right. Well, um, yeah. So December 25th uh, was almost certainly not the day that Jesus was born. Do we know when Jesus was born? No, we don't. We do not know. Now, a lot of people believe that he was born in the fall, that he probably was born around the time of Sukkot because tabernacling, right? And the word became flesh and did what? Tabernacled among us. So we do have these overtones and undertones of Jesus coming at the time of Sukkot. And I think that's entirely plausible, entirely possible. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm good with that if that's the case. But the problem is we don't know, right? We can make our theories, but we don't know. So we know he was born at least during one of the days during the year, right? So that's that's a given. Uh, was it Sukkot? Maybe, right? But there are other people who argue, no, he had to be born at the time of Passover. Okay, maybe that's true too, right? So I think when we start getting dogmatic, about when he was born versus when he was not born. So the truth is we don't know when he was born. There, it's, it's highly unlikely that he would have been born on this date known as Saturnalia. But it's not impossible. All right. So here's what I am for. Rather than telling you what I'm against, I, I like to tell you what I'm for. What I'm for is I'm all for the birth of Jesus. I think the birth of Jesus is a really exciting event. And at least here in America, most people kind of observe this on December 25th, like it or not. Uh, that is when the Christian radio is playing all kinds of cool songs. Um, you know, when they start playing Oh Holy Night, I tend to sing along. Uh, when it's uh, Away in a Manger, I sing along to that, right? Um, because it's on the radio and I'm enjoying it. I listen to it. And so I would rather be known for... Uh, what I'm for than what I'm against. And I think around this time, right, the question starts coming up and I start seeing people getting their guns out. I mean, figurative guns, their theological guns, and they're going to go blast people with the truth. But I really would encourage people to show love during this period. And, you know, if you choose to abstain from uh, the festivities, that's fine. And I understand why it makes a lot of sense. But rather than kind of getting down in the mouth and saying, oh, you're just a bunch of pagans, all you guys, you know, lead by example and lead with love and say, well, here's why I decide not to participate in Santa Claus and Rudolph and um, Christmas trees and all that stuff, because, you know, I see scripture teaching this. And so I want to do this. I want to observe God's feasts. And, um, you know, I'm still very much pro birth of Jesus. We just don't know when that was. And it's my conviction that it wasn't December 25th. So that's probably what I would uh, I would do uh, if uh, you have to talk to somebody about that. All right. One more question from Iris. Can you attend games, game events on the Sabbath? Well, you're going to definitely have different answers uh, from uh, different people on that question. and. I would encourage, um, yeah, I mean, so if I go watch a game, I'm not working, right? That's an entertainment thing for me. Obviously, the people who are putting this on are having to put out some energy, okay? But let's go back to what Scripture tells us to do. It tells us to not do our normal work, okay? And I think we're going to always have, in this world, we're going to always have some sense of challenges as to what is acceptable and what is not. I don't know of anybody who would say, well, you know, during the, during the winter, I, I just cannot use my furnace because, well, that takes gas. And that means some guy back at the gas company has to make sure everything's working properly. And I wouldn't want to inconvenience him by making him do his job. Right. So there's, there will always be jobs that cannot stop, even on the Sabbath. I'm really grateful that doctors and nurses and firemen and policemen go do their jobs on those days. Because you know what? Things happen even on the Sabbath. So probably you're OK going to games 
um, you know, you'll have to kind of assess a situation and say, well, you know, is this honoring to you, Lord, or is this something that maybe uh, I should uh, abstain from? So definitely pray about it. Um, you know, pray about it, but I think you're probably okay. All right, let me take some more questions. So excited about these. This is from uh, Shrauka. Uh, how would one define the falling away in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3 before the coming of the lawless one? All right, great question. I talk about that in Corrupting Image Volume 3, if you do want to check that out. So what I would suggest is that Israel, well, the whole world, but, but specifically Israel, is going to sign the covenant with death and Sheol. So the word for falling away is apostasia. There's also something known as apostasion, which was a divorce certificate. That was the actual certificate, apostasion. So that gives us some insight into the what is the apostasia. It's some kind of a breaking, a dissolution of a contract, specifically a marriage contract, but, but not only a marriage contract, right? So there's some agreement between two parties that is then broken. So uh, in Daniel chapter 12, it talks about how Michael, the chief prince who stands watch over your people, something's going to happen. It says that in that day, um, he is going to stand up. All right, let's go to that. There will be a time of trouble. But wait a second. So the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, like, like never before. So wait, there's going to be a time of trouble but isn't he standing watch over the sons of your people? What happened? What changed that suddenly it seems like he's on the job, but then it seems like he's not on the job. And what I would submit to you is that he was on the job until we have this falling away. We have this, this break in the relationship. And I think that is where Israel is then going to go and they're going to assume uh, or take on the covenant of death right and we see that in isaiah 28 here therefore the word of the lord you scornful men who rule this people who are in jerusalem because you've said we've made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we are in agreement when the overflowing scourge passes through it will not come to us we've made lies our refuge and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves that seems to be to be the very very similar language that we have in second thessalonians so I would suggest that the man of sin cannot come on the scene because it's an authority issue. And as long as Michael is there and he's wanted by Israel, then he will have authority to keep doing what he's doing. But then when this, this break in this relationship and this covenant happens, then he's put out of a job and then the man of sin can rise up because now the authority base has changed. All right. I say that in, uh, with some more details in Corrupting Image, Volume 2, if you're interested. All right. Uh, this is from Christy. I loved Haunted Theology. Will you do more films on biblical history? Um, well, I, I certainly have intentions to do that. I try to do them uh, as the need arises, so I don't have anything at the moment planned. But uh, I will be making more videos for this channel. I'm going to start making some shorts. And I'm going to also make um, uh, some, should we call them more edited kind of videos that I think will hopefully uh, help people um, understand some of the things that are going on. <laughs> so very cool. All right. Let's go to another question. This is from the God I Know. You have lost a fair amount of weight. Do you think it's important that believers have their bodies under subjection? Is that something the modern church has forgotten or ignored? Um, wow. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I did lose about uh, 39 pounds, so I'm really happy about that. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I think we can make our bellies our God, and I think we've got to be very careful that we don't do that. Uh, I know it's incredibly easy, so I'm not throwing stones at anybody. I know it's incredibly easy, uh, even before, as I was eating relatively healthy, again, relatively, um, you know, I was not binging on certain things, but I was having a tremendous amount of salt. And uh, I finally got to the place where I'm like, 
boy, I'm having way too much salt. <laughs> so I finally got over that and I did a few other things. I have a lot more smoothies now. And so that made, uh, that really helped me to lose a lot of weight. But yes, uh, I do think that what we're basically asking is about gluttony, right? And does the modern church take part in a fair amount of gluttony? I think it does. Okay. And again, I'm not throwing stones at anybody because um, I've had my own my own issues. So yeah, uh, there's a fair amount of gluttony and uh, we, we do need to be careful. So I think we need to put our bodies in subjection. Uh, the cool thing is if you find the right kind of formula, the right diet, you're not having to, to work hard at it. Uh, I just made smoothies, um, put the ingredients in myself and I love them. I feel great. So I didn't feel that I was somehow denying myself, uh, any, any, uh, any kind of food. So, well, any kosher food, right? All right. This is a uh, question from Randy. Do you think the command to wear tzitzit or talit katan undershirt is for Gentile followers of Yeshua. Well, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't say it, it whether it's for Gentiles or just for Jews. I would suggest that the interpretation that is um, that the the Jews the the Jews have about wearing a talit or the tzitziot. I would suggest that it is not, uh, I, I, I'll say this, I don't interpret it that way, okay? I don't think that's the interpretation. What I would suggest is that the talit that does have tassels on its four corners, I think that is the fulfillment of wearing tzitzio. Now, there are people in the way congregation who would see things differently, and I don't try to dissuade them from that. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine if people want to stick those on their belt buckles. Um, but I, I'm not convinced that that is what scripture is telling me to do. Uh, I think that putting them on the talit is sufficient. Uh, that is that prayer shawl, in case you guys are not aware of that, but that's the prayer shawl. And that is um, a fulfillment of what scripture is telling me to do. Uh, and so that's why I don't actually wear that's it you. But, um, but again, I know a lot of people who do, and I don't try to dissuade them because I think this is a relatively minor issue. Um, and I'm not trying to push my perspective on them. And, uh, so far, nobody's tried to push their perspective on me, which is, which has been good. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that, I hope that helps a bit. Um, uh, that's a, that's a challenging one, but I, in my opinion, I don't think that we are required to wear the talit katan, which would be under, it's basically an undershirt. Um, and uh, and if you did, you certainly would not tuck it in. You would, of course, let it hang out as people are going to do it. So I think there's some freedom to, to do that. Okay, uh, this is uh, from Jamie. Any help or tips when in fellowship pre-tribe people who want to think for themselves, they just keep referring to Rabbi Arnold F. I guess that's Fruchtenbaum. I'm not sure. I know uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. He's a good scholar. Um, I I don't know. Uh, I'm not really quite following your question. I'm sorry, but um, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's just I don't know. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's see here. All right. A lot of uh, interesting discussion here. Okay, so, okay, oh, so, okay, apparently everything looks fine from where you are. Great, well, good, uh, very good, very good. Okay, uh, more conversation, which is great. All right, so. Okay, here's a question from Matt. Um have you read Tortured by Christ from uh, Wombrand? Yes, I did read that. And um, I did. Uh, it was a powerful book. All right, this is from Randy. What are your thoughts on Messianic Bible translations, Tree of Life, New Jerusalem Version, etc.? Or do you prefer standard ones like ESV, NASB, Legacy, Standard, Net, etc.? Yeah, so I typically go with the latter, Randy. Um I'm certainly not opposed to Messianic translations, but 
I mean, I understand the philosophy behind it. They want to get the original names back, and that's fine. You know, but for someone who doesn't speak Hebrew, I don't know that it's necessary. I think part of it, if I'm going to be really honest here, I think part of it is that people feel that there's something special or magical or, or power, powerful about saying saying these names in Hebrew. And look, I love Hebrew. I studied Hebrew at the Hebrew Uni University of Jerusalem. I love Hebrew. And so if you're just wanting to read a translation that has those names retained because you like it, it sounds nice, uh, it sort of helps you feel connected, great. You know, I think that's wonderful. But I think those translations, when used in a corporate setting, I think they can be rather uh, distracting and they can sometimes drive people away. So it, it kind of depends on what is the purpose, why people are using it and, um, you know, what they're hoping to accomplish with that. But I think people have different, uh, different tastes, different styles, and that's okay. But if they're using it because they think, well, this is going to somehow, you know, score me points with God or draw me closer to God. I would, I would uh, generally disagree with that because I don't think it's going to really change a person's perspective uh, all that much. So yeah, that's kind of a, that's a tricky one for sure uh, to be fair. Okay. Let me see here. All right. This is from Samuel in first Enoch. It teaches that demons come from the disembodied spirits of Nephilim, but you teach that demons are fallen angels. Is that portion of Enoch not reliable? Well, Samuel, what I would suggest is that portion of Enoch could be understood in a different way, right? So in, in my book, Corrupting the Image Volume 2, what I'm suggesting is that when a fallen angel, the sons of God, mated with women, what the, the product was, yes, a Nephilim, right? But it was basically an avatar. It was an empty core. It had nothing in it. It was just a body, just like the movie Avatar, right? And they make that, that blue alien. And then it needs to be somehow um, have a spirit in it. And that's what happened in the entire movie. Okay. So that's where I suggest that, yes, when the Nephilim were killed, the spirits that left them were the same as the fallen angels. And so I think first, first Enoch is correct, but I would interpret it saying, yes, that's true. But the spirits that were in there in the first place were fallen angel spirits. Okay. So, but because otherwise you have this really yucky situation where you have an entire race of beings who came into existence through no fault of their own. And just because of who their fathers were, they are automatically consigned to destruction and hell and the abyss. And I, don't really see God acting that way. God is always perfectly fair. Everybody gets a choice. So if you just have this race that like, well, I was just born this way. It's not my fault. I really think that causes a huge theological problem. And the word um, demonia and fallen angel. I mean, you don't even have fallen angel in the Hebrew Bible or anywhere in the text. There's no place where it talks about fallen angels. That's a term that we've come up with to help us distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys. But if you look in Romans or uh, Revelation chapter 12, it says that Michael and his angels fought and Satan and his angels fought. It doesn't say Satan's fallen angels. We know they're fallen because that's the term that we've used to identify them. But the word demonia simply means mighty ones and it means really the same thing. So I don't think there's any qualitative difference. And there's no linguistic difference when we start looking at these. So uh, I do have an appendix at the end of Corrupting Image Volume 2, which is also on my YouTube channel or on my, uh, on my website, douglashamp.com, if you want to check that out, where I show that linguistically they're, they're the same thing. And I even show in scripture how they were talking about one and the same thing. Satan is the king of what? He's the king of the demons. Because he's also the same guy in Revelation 12 where Satan and his angels fought. They're the same exact thing. So I think people have, I think they've misinterpreted what First Enoch is saying. 
and they've made all these doctrines about it that I think are baseless uh, when it comes to history, when it comes to theology, when it comes to linguistics. I don't think those are on anything that is substantive. And so that is why I reject that idea. All right. This is from uh, Theocracy. Sean, what is the secret place in Psalms 91? All right. Well, let's take a look at Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. All right. So, uh, yeah, the word there is secret. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, what is that secret place? Um, so, let me just have a little um uh, disclaimer i'm not a hundred percent sure what the secret place is but i'll give you my best thought on what that secret place is um and let's keep reading and i think that will probably give us the answer okay so i will save the lord he is my refuge and my fortress my god in him i will trust surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. All right, so go back to the secret place. So as we're looking in here, obviously you have some uh, metaphoric language. I don't think that God has feathers as far as I can tell. I don't think he has wings on him as well. But... Um, uh, if we're using this analogy, this imagery, then if you are, if you're staying close to God, if you dwell in that secret place, you're going to abide under the shadow. So again, whatever that secret place is, it's, it's being in him. It's thinking about him, having him on your thoughts and knowing that he is your fortress and your deliverer. He's your refuge. So that's what I would suggest. I don't think that this is a a place kind of like an X marks the spot kind of place, but this is more of a, a state of mind, a state of being uh, in your relationship to God. That's, that's how I would, that's how I would uh, settle that um, in my mind. Okay. Uh, good. That's great. That's really, uh, really a great, great question. All right. This is from Tina. Could you explain why some people and pastors think we are in the thousand year reign? Oh, Tina, I, <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I really don't think we're in the thousand year reign. If we're in the thousand year reign, I am very disappointed. I want my money back because this world is still a big mess. And if this is as good as it gets during the thousand year reign, it's very, very disappointing. So, there are some different theories out there, different theologies. One is called amillennialism, right? So if you are amillennial, you essentially think that there is no millennium. Hence, we are essentially in that period of God's rule and reign on this earth. They would not think it's a thousand years long, but it's just, it's just, this is it. This is God's rule and reign. They do that because they believe that the church 100% replaced Israel. And so therefore, if the church replaced Israel, and we know that the church or that we know that Israel is supposed to be triumphant on the earth and was supposed to have this this uh, this kingdom on the earth. Well, if if the church has taken that play its place, then then you have to somehow account for that in your theology. And that would lead you to a millennialism of saying that, well, we're actually in that time right now. And I reject that theology because I think it has a lot of uh, a lot of holes in it. Um, so, yeah, um, great. Uh, this is from David on food. The idol issue is why I don't eat at Asian restaurants because I haven't found any without incense to Buddha, dragons, etc. Okay, and I think that is a fair um, a, a fair conviction to have. So that's very good. All right. And let's see. Here's another question. Just like Ezra. If Enlil is Helel, Satan, wouldn't that make Enki, Yahuwah, uh, Enki told uh, Atrahasis to build a boat right? So, well, so here's the thing is that 
when when we start comparing um, the Sumerian literature, the ancient Mesopotamian literature with the Bible, uh, we're probably not in every situation going to have a hundred percent equivalence. Okay, so I would suggest that Yehovah, as you know, Yudhe Vavhe, is really the uh, it, it probably as close as we can come would be Anu, the Creator God. And I say that loosely because the way that the Mesopotamian texts describe Anu, he's not all that amazing, right? But he's essentially the, the downplayed creator God who got everything going and now he's kind of out of a job. Uh, and, uh, and so now it's Enlil, okay? Now, as far as Enki, Enki uh, actually means Lord of the Earth. En is um, Lord. And then Ki is earth, just like Enlil is the lord of the air, and Ki is the lord of the earth. Now, what's interesting, uh, if we look at the word Ninurta, Ninurta, um, Urta probably comes from the word, uh, well, Urta, which is like Eretz, if you know your Hebrew. So that's the same root. Uh, so this would be Akkadian. So Ninurta would be also lord of the earth. That is a very possible translation and i'm getting that from amar anus out of finland so uh if you don't like you can take it up with him <laughs> but i think that makes a lot of sense uh so so enki very well could be basically nimrod but again if we're trying to find a hundred percent equivalence i think we're going to kind of tie ourselves in knots and get frustrated because they don't always have a hundred percent equivalence and that's why essentially i didn't really talk about enki in the book because I don't think that we have to have, you know, well, this guy is necessarily that guy. You know, it doesn't always work out that way because, you know, there is these are myths. These are uh, tales that are meant to explain sort of how the world is the way it is. Um, and I, I'm I'm happy to I'm willing to live with that uh, tension uh, in that. So. All right. And let's see, did I get all the questions? Very good. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys. And we're right on time. So thank you so much. Always uh, glad that you're here. Uh, it really means a lot to me. So again, if you want to become a patron, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Doug Hamp. And a gift of any size is very much appreciated. I hope you'll join me tomorrow night for the Way Wednesday's virtual midrash. And then on, Wednesday, on Thursday, we're going to have our Prophecy Roundtable once again. All right.